Well, we'll keep going. Again, uh, my name is Paul Berger, and thank you, Lori. Um, uh, my name is Paul Berger. I'm president and senior uh, industrial hygienist from Nova Environmental Solutions, based here in Winchester. Um, we do environmental consulting, industrial hygiene work, so essentially anything that's either environmental, uh, whether it be indoor air quality, mold, water testing, um, uh, bacteria, or industrial hygiene uh, services, uh, we do that type of uh, inspection testing, that type of work. But today, for today's presentation, uh, we're going to be focusing on, or I'm going to be focusing on and discussing indoor air quality and your health. Um, and there's a lot of fact uh, factors that come in with indoor air quality. So the objectives for today's presentation is to identify indoor air quality contaminants uh, and describe the common uh, uh, health effects uh, related to the, uh, those indoor air quality contaminants. Uh, I want to provide you an understanding of the sources of contaminants. So, you know, sometimes we, we don't know where everything comes from. Um, and then also, the most importantly, are ways to improve our indoor air quality uh, and, and help to prevent or, or improve our in, indoor air quality. We're going to start off with this short video. Hopefully, it will get rolling and it should. In 160 seconds, you will decide how this story ends. This is a story about us, the indoor generation, a generation that spends 90% of its life indoors. It all started the day we left nature behind. We filled our homes with lovely things and all the stuff we wanted. Our homes became places you would never want to leave. Artificial light replaced daylight and we built our houses so that nothing could escape. We cooked and showered, breathed and played, slept and sweated. But we had closed ourselves in to a point where nothing could get out. So when the air turned bad inside, I tried fixing it with chemicals. I would put in little artificial suns everywhere to make the darkness bearable. That's when things started to happen. Hard to notice in the beginning. Some needed help to sleep to breathe, to not itch. Many of us even started to feel sad. So we turned on happy lamps to make the sadness go away. Then scientists discovered that the air inside our homes is up to five times more polluted than the air outside that the lack of daylight can affect children's learning and increase blood pressure. It turns out that kids' rooms often have the highest concentration of toxicants in the house. In fact, millions of homes are unhealthy to live in. They discovered that living in damp and moldy homes increases the risk of asthma by 40%. And I learned that millions of people like me suffer from asthma and allergies caused by a bad indoor environment. And so, here we are. How the story ends is up to you because it's not written yet. If you care about the indoor generation, do something. Begin to think and live differently. Let light and fresh air into your life again. Even small changes can make a huge difference for coming generations. Learn how at theindoorgeneration.com. So that video was actually viewed, I think, right around 4 million times now. But it's just a nice, powerful video, in my opinion, uh, to kind of get a, give, give you a feel of you know, what we're really dealing with uh, in many cases. So what is indoor, indoor air quality and, and what's it all about? So we breathe roughly about 35 gallons of air every day. Uh, that's about 20,000 breaths. And a lot of it is filled or air is filled with tiny particles, some uh, uh, gases, and we're always around something in the air. Uh, and some are toxic and can be toxic to our health. 
So, but air quality is, uh, is when we're assessing air quality, it's both the air quality within and around our buildings and our houses. Uh, but indoor air quality does impact and can impact the health and comfort of, of building op occupants. And according to the US EPA, American Lung Association, World Health Organization, Health Canada, indoor air quality pollutants are one of the greatest risks uh, to human health. Um, so how small are, are, what are we breathing? How small are these things? So I'm gonna try to use, hopefully this works, a little laser pointer here. So right down here, this is about the size of a grain of sand, which is 90 microns in size. A human hair, that's what this represents, is about 50 to 70 diameters in uh, microns in diameters. So a lot of the stuff that we're breathing every day, dust, pollens, molds, mold spores, and other, uh, other common uh, particles, they're generally what's referred to as PM10 or uh, a, a particulate matter that's about 10 microns in size or, or lower. And that's right here, these little blue balls. And then you'll see these little pink dots. Those are what's called the tiny particles or PM2.5. And we are breathing those every day. And that could be uh, combustion particles, uh, organic compounds, uh, volatile organic compounds, other metals. <clears throat> I can say that going back to molds, um, specifically for mold spores, they could range, generally range between two microns to 10 microns in size, depending on the species and the, and the types of molds. Uh, so that just kind of gives you a reference of the size of the particles and, and the size of the stuff that we're breathing in every day. So I'll move into the, the next slide, which goes into where these, where these particles end up and where all these uh, uh, um, uh, articles and fragments end up. So the particle fractions, so the inhalable ones, those end up you know, in our nose and our mouths and generally uh, right up in here. And those are the larger particles which our body gets rid of naturally uh, easily. The smaller particles, uh, which are known as the, the thoracic fractions, if you will. Uh, those are ones that are generally about 10 microns or smaller. So those could get past the larynx and into this area of the, of the lungs of the um, in here into the cilium. And then finally, the tiniest particles are the respirable particles. Those are the uh, less than four microns generally is, is, uh, is the fractions uh, for respirable, respirable particulates. And some of those can include mold spores and then other, other, part, uh, other tiny particulates. Those are the ones that can get embedded into your actual lungs, go past the cilia and get inside of your lungs. So why is it important to improve in indoor air quality? And we'll get into that. So people spend about 90% of their times indoors. Uh, air pollution levels um, in the videos, and they said like five times, well, EPA has done a, a study not too long ago that air pollution indoors can be sometimes up to 100 times higher indoors than outdoors. And indoor air quality not only affects health, but it can affect produ productivity of your children, of, of you at work. Um, and uh, so that's why uh, uh, not just immediate health effects, uh, but also, again, your, your productivity. Um, the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology states that 50% uh, of all responsible uh, respiratory illnesses are caused or aggravated by poor indoor air quality. And indoor air quality uh, has been linked to various uh, um, uh, health effects. Most common symptoms, uh, or I'm sorry, the most common uh, adverse health effects are allergies and asthma, fatigue, headaches, concentration problems. So what are sources of pollutants? And we'll this is the, uh, uh, where we're gonna get into some of the co uh, contaminants. We've got biological contaminants, molds and moisture, animals, insects, bacteria, viruses. Uh, those are biological contaminants. Uh, temperature and relative humidity extremes, they are major functions of indoor air quality. And I'll get into that in, next, but uh, they, they certainly play a major role in indoor air quality. Uh, particulates from smoke, outdoor air, uh, cleaning supplies, uh, or just cleaning in general. And it can be smokes from burning candle, burning incenses, or other smoke, uh, fireplaces, things of that nature. Inadequate air, circul 
air circulation and ventilation. Are you getting enough fresh air in the house? Is there enough uh, air circulation in your building where you're working, fresh air uh, in your building? So uh, um, if there's inadequate air circulation or ventilation, that could uh, increase the indoor air quality pollutants and actually can create an environment that may make it more conducive for biological contaminants to exist and, and thrive. Uh, carbon monoxide is a major pollutant source that I'm sure many or most of you are aware of and have heard of, and uh, volatile organic compounds. If you saw a little picture, uh, and there's, we're going to get into volatile organic compounds um, uh, in, this, in this presentation. And then uh, radon is another major pollutant source, especially in this region. So I wanted to get into how I talked about temperature and relative humidity and how they're major functions of indoor air quality. But this chart, which is supplied by the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers, gives us a, a pretty good sense as to how relative humidity uh, can affect not only human comfort, but if increase or, or affect other contaminants. The general recommendation is to keep humidity between generally between 30 and 60 percent indoors all year round. Optimal is right around 50 percent at all times, even if you're away from the house, uh, keeping humidity around 50 percent uh, year round. So what this graph or this this table shows is like for bacteria, which we do uh, quite a few of uh, bacteria assessments. Um, the higher the the or I'm sorry the uh, the higher the bar, the higher the the activity for those contaminants. So bacteria can thrive in rel in really low um, uh, uh, humidity as well as really high humidity. Viruses, and I'm sure we're all virused out, <laughs> but viruses certainly can thrive um, when it is really extremely dry. And when humidity is really starting to get 80, 90, 100% humidity. Yes, there is some viral activity um, between 30 and 50%, but as you can see, it definitely decreases. Fungi, which includes molds, all molds are fungi, not all fungi are molds. Uh, so fungi can include mushrooms, and, uh, um, but uh, mold especially. You see, when it's dry, Fungi molds are not really uh, affected, but once we start getting humidity, uh, starting to get above 60%, and especially, you know, the 70, 80, 90% range, that is really conducive uh, for fungal activity, uh, mold activity. Dust mite activity as well. Um, around 50%, we start seeing an increase of dust mites, and then again, once it gets more humid. And then I'll briefly go through the, the bottom ones, but respiratory infections can start when it's too dry, mostly because your mucous membranes are not are, are drying out. So you're not uh, your body's not able to expel as much of the the other uh, particulates and, and stuff that we're breathing in um, and the uh, aller, uh, allergic and asthma, allergic rhinitis and, and asthma. Again, the least amount of activities during the in that 30 to 60 percent range. So, again, that 30 per 60 relative humidity percent range, that, that's optimal. Let me move on. Jump right into mold. So mold right now, there's, there's about 1,000 species of known mold uh, in the United States. There's roughly about 100,000 known species worldwide. Um, and outdoors, mold plays a real important role. We would not be alive without mold. Uh, let's just put it that way. Uh, so, but they, are, um, they break down matter, uh, fallen leaves, dead animals, toppled trees. Uh, molds are very important too for uh, for many food production. Um, we wouldn't have some cheeses without molds or um, um, some certain medicines. Pen uh, penicillin uh, is derived from a species of, of mold. So there are some good things about mold, but uh, we definitely want to avoid mold growth indoors. Uh, and molds can grow on virtually any substance as long as there's moisture, moisture or water, uh, oxygen, and an organic source. Basically anything that has, that's got a carbon compound, molds can feed on, on that substance. Molds prefer damp or wet building materials such as uh, damp drywall, wood, uh, high, high cellulose materials. Um, so not only are molds uh, can affect our health, but they're also affecting the structural integrity of buildings. Just, as, just like molds are breaking down the organic matter outdoors, 
that's what they're doing to the building materials inside of our structures if it's left unchecked. So molds are eating away at the drywall, at the wood. So if you ever see wood rot, well, a lot of that wood rot is because of mold or fungal activity that's eating away at the sugars uh, inside the wood. So, so again, not only is it important for health purposes, but it's also important for uh, to identify any mold issues, mold and moisture issues due to structural integrity of buildings. Um, so mold exposure, mold exposures, uh, about 50% of all homes have mold, uh, and whether it's visible or not on the wall or inside. So there's likely to be some sort of mold in about 50% of all homes. 93% uh, of chronic sinus infections can be attributed to mold exposures. 40% uh, of people can develop asthma uh, as, a relation, as, a, uh, as it relates to mold exposures. And then again, 21% of all asthma cases is directly related to, uh, to mold. So here's some just examples of molds and uh, uh, mold growth. Again, as I stated before, molds need water indoors to grow, some sort of moisture source. So mold growth due to water intrusion, floods, leaks, plumbing, uh, plumbing issues, condensation from metal ductwork or, or from plumbing. This is what this picture is typically what we we find it you get all sorts of molds that, that grow on drywall. This is a picture that I took from from one site where there was just a chronic water intrusion from this is in a basement level closet and water was coming in from the exterior wall running in and just causing all this nastiness. Then we also have what's known as humidity induced mold growth. So mold growth can grow, certain species of Aspergillus penicillium can grow and survive. They're very dry tolerant. So when humidity levels are maintained roughly at about 60 to 70% indoors, we could end up with this. This is a very common, and I see this, I did take this picture of a home where you get some mold growth on shoes, on clothing, on furniture, underneath stairs. So anywhere where there's air stagnation, humidity. Um, uh, 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 so you don't always need a leak or a flood to have mold growth. And again, these molds are very common in uh, humidity induced, but they can, be, they can cause some serious health issues, especially dealing with species of Aspergillus and Penicillium. So how does, how does one get exposed to mold? Inhalation is the most common route of exposure. Obviously we're breathing in mold spores. We're breathing in mold spores every day, but what you don't wanna do and try to avoid is to breathe in higher, un, uh, high concentrations over extended periods of time. So inhalation of spores and mold fragments, um, meaning the hyphal elements is, what we're, uh, is one route of exposure. And the other main route of exposure is eating eating foods that have mold uh, and ingesting foods that have mold. Um, and it's not always fruit. I mean, you could have cereal grains uh, that have mold where you may not actually see mold, but if, if cereals or oats or, or things of that nature are being stored in somewhat more of a damp environment and not a really dry environment, you're going to get some molds that, that can develop on those foods. So the health effects attributed to mold, uh, we've got hypersensitivity, which is basically your allergic type reactions, toxicity, and infections. Um, clinical research is still relatively limited and studies are very limited as far as the health effects attributed mold. And there are some controversies with major organiz organizations that say, well, the, how do we quantify or what do we say? You know, the, the, and are there enough studies, clinical studies or epidemiology studies that could de definitively link certain molds to certain, uh, certain health effects? So again, that's why clinical research and studies are still very, very limited. But we do know that molds can cause some allergic responses. Um, and uh, they could be from either inhalation or touching molds or eating molds uh, can cause allergic, allergic reactions in sensitive individuals. Um, exposure to molds uh, in sensitive, uh, the sensitive population is roughly about 10% of people who are known to have mold allergies. With most allergens, low doses over long periods of time are likely needed for someone to become sensitized or to develop an allergy to molds. And then higher doses, once you become sensitized, 
higher doses are likely for, uh, for symptoms. Again, I'm using the terms likely, uh, um, uh, probably, because there is no definitive answer. There are no definitive answers. It's all based on someone's individual sensitivities, their own genetic dispositions. Uh, so I'm gonna use some generally uh, general terms that, are, that we use in the industry. Mold toxicity, and I'm sure many of you have heard about mold mycotoxins. So what are mycotoxins? Uh, certain species molds do, do create uh, byproducts of mycotoxins. So they're basically chemicals that are released by the molds. And why we think what's, what we think why molds produce these toxins are to help fight off other invading species of molds. So there's, again, as I said, there's thousands of species of molds and they're all competing for the same food sources. So a lot of these molds produce these mycotoxins to help fight off other invading species so that they, so that they, uh, they win out, they, they're on the food sources. Uh, and these mold mycotoxins, <clears throat> again, can be found in damper water damaged building materials and food. Uh, so again, it's not always mold growth that, that where you could be exposed to and um, uh, have mycotoxins in your system as relate uh, due to molds on, on building materials, but also in foods. <clears throat> Excuse me. The most common examples of, of mycotoxins are aflatoxin and ochratoxins, but there are a lot of um, uh, other mycotoxins uh, that, um, that are commonly associated with molds. And I'm going to stop just for a quick second, and just so everyone who, who's here knows, at the end, I will be answering any questions that you may have. So we're going to hold off on, on questions until the end. Uh, there is a group chat. Uh, there's a chat function. So if you want to type in a question, I'll address any questions that I can at the end of, at the, end of the presentation. Just want to get that in there. So if anyone thinks that, that I'm going too fast or has a question, uh, we will address any questions uh, at the end. Uh, going back to uh, molds and health effects. So another one in molds can, uh, there can be fungal infections or mold infections. Um, those are especially with uh, weakened immune systems uh, can develop an invasive mold infection either days to weeks after exposure, uh, if they're living in that environment. Um, exposure to molds, uh, a mold that grows a result of water damage increases the risk of infection of infectious uh, uh, molds. But according to the C, uh, CDC, mold infections are rare. Uh, they're typically caused by uh, aspergillus um, and there are other opportunistic fungal pathogens, but aspergillus is typically the most common genre mold. And there are certain species within aspergillus that are more associated with infections. Um, but they are, and, and mold infections are difficult to diagnose. Um, jumping back to aspergillus, there is an actual specific uh, infection directly related to aspergillus called aspergillosis, and that's where the uh, aspergillus can actually grow inside of the lungs. Um, so I know in hospital settings, um, we've been called in, or I've been called in to do mold, mold inspections in, into air quality testing. And they really want to know what species of aspergillus may be present um, in, in certain areas. Uh, so, uh, but again, infections related to molds are rare. But here are some symptoms, uh, and I'm going to talk about some mold exposure symptoms. But first things first, I'm not a doctor and I don't play one on TV. So any, if anyone has any symptoms that are that we're about to uh, grow up, it may or may not be related to molds. Best to consult with your healthcare practitioner. Um, but these are very common or most common symptoms related to mold exposures. And many of you may, may uh, see a recurring theme here, but sneezing, sore throat, uh, sore or hoarse throat, cold and flu symptoms, asthma, nosebleeds, chronic fatigue. And I'm going to jump through some of these. And some of these you may not be even be aware of, but uh, some of these symptoms have been linked to mold exposures, memory loss, attention deficit and concentration problems, personality changes, other neurological disorders, uh, hair loss. I've had clients who have had uh, chronic hair loss problems directly related to molds and mold exposures. Um, and those and some of the others uh, here are symptoms that are known related exposures uh, to mold. 
So I'm going to end there on mold. And again, I can't address any mold issues. Uh, um, so I'm going to get into uh, the chemical contaminants now as it relates to indoor air quality. So what we'll be talking about specifically are carbon monoxides uh, or carbon monoxide, volatile organic compounds and radon. Uh, so for carbon monoxide, uh, carbon monoxide is a colorless and odorless tasteless gas. Um, and I'm sure many of you, I hope all of you have at least carbon monoxide detectors in your home, especially if you have, if you have any um, um, gas fired or, or fueled uh, furnaces or hot water tanks, um, you should have carbon monoxide. Um, and, and sources include unvented fuel fired appliances, uh, um, and then other uh, tobacco wood burning uh, gas gas uh, powered uh, uh, equipment and, and oils. So for carbon monoxide, uh, what are typical levels in a home? We could find them anywhere between 0.5 to 5 uh, parts per million. Generally, it's expected and acceptable, if you will, in a properly functioning uh, gas fireplace or a furnace or or even. Um, uh, gas-fueled um, uh, appliances to have carbon monoxide levels at or about 5 to 15 parts per million. There are workplace limits uh, at 35 parts per million over an eight-hour time-weighted average. But where we start to see is if, if uh, carbon monoxide levels are about 100 parts per, parts per million, leave the area easily, immediately. Dizziness, uh, nausea, and fatigue are some of the most, uh, the initial symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning. And that's where you, get, when levels are at about 200 parts per million. <clears throat> and then as you can see, the higher up we go, uh, it, carbon monoxide poisoning can be fatal and relatively quickly. Um, so <clears throat> again, with, as I get into the, what we could do to improve it, one of the things is to definitely get carbon monoxide, especially if you're using any gas, uh, gas appliances. We're gonna go into volatile organic compounds. So volatile organic compounds are all carbon-based chemicals. Uh, there are thousands of VOCs. They're naturally occurring or synthetic. Uh, and they're typically higher indoors than outdoors. And for a couple of reasons, obviously we've got VOC sources and I'll get into the sources indoors, but why we not only uh, because outdoors there's a lot more air, but as far as concentration goes, but also because they're carbon-based, uh, UV helps break down those carbon uh, binders in the chemicals. So once it's out, once VOCs are out in sunlight, those those VOCs or those chemicals uh, uh, break apart, if you will. Some volatile organic compounds are highly toxic. Others can be moderately toxic, and then some are just mildly toxic. Uh, so why should you care about VOCs? Well, VOCs in homes, there's many sources. Uh, we've got paints and paint strippers and other solvents. We've got uh, um, some clean, and I'm not sure if I can move this at all, uh, aerosol sprays, cleaners, disinfectants, um, detergents, air fresheners, perfumes, scented candles, potpourri, hand sanitizers. They all emit uh, volatile organic compounds. Uh, furnitures, uh, cabinetry, mattresses, some laminate flooring products, so building materials that are installed or, or furnitures that you buy, those all emit or can emit some volatile organic compounds. Um, we often get called in uh, with complaints after remodeling a home, furniture's been installed or uh, new flooring or cabinetry's been installed and some of the occupants when they come in uh, especially if their house has been sealed up for a while, start uh, complaining, oh, I'm getting these, these odors or I'm getting headaches and I don't know if it's because of the furniture or carpeting or whatever the case may be. So that's not uncommon, uh, an uncommon complaint that we get called in to, to help investigate uh, those issues. So the health effects related to carbon, uh, uh, I'm sorry, to volatile organic compounds, um, again, asthma attacks, itchy eyes, sneezy running nose, headaches, noticing a theme here with, with some of them, both with molds and with VOCs. Um, but then again, uh, irritation, throat irritation, headaches, fatigue are just common, uh, common complaints that we receive that may be a result of volatile organic compounds. 
in a typical indoor environment, it's not uncommon. It's generally found to be acceptable where VOC total volatile organic compounds are generally in between the 50 parts per billion range and 500 parts per billion range. Once we start, <clears throat> again, seeing levels above the 500 parts per billion as a total volatile organic compound level, that's where some red flags start to start to pop up um, uh, when we're doing an investigation. Uh, Long-term exposures to VOCs have been known to cause some kidney damage, uh, elevated blood pressure. Uh, so, uh, so those are some of the known long-term effects to, uh, to volatile organic compounds. And we're going to move on over to radon now. Um, radon is a naturally occurring gas that you can't see, smell, or taste. Uh, its presence is in your home, and it certainly can pose a, a, a danger. And radon is formed by natural, natural radioactive decay of uranium in rocks in the Earth's crust. Um, and it is found in all 50 states. Um, radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer in America and radon uh, related lung cancer, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, does claim more than 20,000 lives annually. Uh, radon is the leading cause of lung cancer among non-smokers. So, and that is a, a national stat that is a leading cause of lung cancer among non-smokers. And according to the Virginia Department of Health, approximately 600 people every year are believed to have died from radon-related lung cancer in Virginia. And I'll just pop up a map here. Uh, this map is courtesy of US CPA, <clears throat> and it gives zones of the highest potential for, uh, for, uh, uh, for what EPA says is the screening level of four picocuries uh, per liter or higher. Uh, so as you can see, we're, most of us are in the Winchester and the Northern Virginia area. We're all in the red to, red to orange zones, um, which again are counties that are known uh, to have uh, relatively, uh, uh, there's a high potential or moderate potential for, uh, for radon to exceed the EPA's guidance levels of four picocuries per liter. So why, again, why is radon a concern? Radon decay product, uh, radon decays into radioactive particles known as radon decay products. Uh, these particles are easily inhaled and deposited in the lungs. So it's not the, it's really not the gas radon, if you will, that, that, we're, that we're concerned about. And that's what we measure um, if, if radon is tested for, it's measuring radon levels, but it's really the decay products uh, that are inhaled. And those lungs or those decay products damage the lung tissue. Uh, so the de radon uh, uh, decay products decay into uh, plutonium-218 and plutonium-214, and they emit alpha particles. And those particles are just constantly striking the lungs, and they cause physical and chemical and ke physical damage to the lungs, and can actually cause dam uh, chemical damage, changing the DNA. Uh, so that's why radon is definitely a, a, a concern, especially in this region. So what can we do? Well, the most effective air quality control measure is source control. We have a lot of control as to what we're being exposed to. Um, so you are in control as much as you, uh, uh, of much of the indoor air quality pollution. First thing that I always tell, fresh air is your friend. On days where it's clement weather, like today, like yesterday, open windows, let fresh air in. Not only does it uh, um, feel good, but it also allows just common particles and, and stuff that has built up to, to exhaust out. You're getting cross breezes. You're getting a ventilation of, of the structure of your home. So fresh air is your friend. Correct all uncontrolled sources of moisture. Uh, so what that means is if there are any plumbing leaks or if you're having water leaking in your basement, even if it's an, even if it's occasional uh, dampness in your basement, it's coming from somewhere. So you have to really identify to correct it to not only prevent damage to the structure, but also prevent, help prevent mold growth. Um, maintain humidity levels. Again, between that 30 per 60 percent range is recommended. Ideal is at about 50 percent or below at all times. 
if you're going away on vacation or taking a two week vacation or a three week vacation, especially in the summertime, don't shut off your air conditioning, let it run. Um, I've been involved in way too many uh, projects where people have gone away on vacation, summer vacation for two weeks or three weeks, and they shut off their air conditioning. They come home and lo and behold, there is mold growth everywhere throughout their house because they didn't keep their air conditioning running, the humidity inside their home. We're in Northern Virginia. It gets humid here. It gets warm here. You've got new food sources in your home. Perfect environment for mold to grow when it's warm, humid, no air movement. And you get, uh, so please, if you're going away or um, um, uh, keep that humidity uh, at or below 50% at all times. Maintain good housekeeping. Get into those hidden dust reservoirs. Uh, move, uh, occasionally move your refrigerator out, move your stoves out, vacuum up all that dust and junk that, that kind of gets hidden. But maintaining good housekeeping is really a major function uh, of, of, of keeping, uh, of improving your air quality. Making sure your exhaust vents, your dryer vents, your bathroom vents, your kitchen vents are all exhausted to the exterior. Um, and a lot of times they can be your, your uh, especially dryer vents, because uh, dryers do vibrate and, and they can disconnect when dryers are running They're they're trying to exhaust out all that water, if you will. <laughs> so it's just hot, moist air. So if your dryer vents are disconnected, if they're running through, uh, I've been in homes where they're running through the basement. And if you're starting to see dryer lint all over the place, then that probably means that there's a disconnect somewhere in your dryer vent. Uh, so making sure your exhaust vents are, are connected and exhausted to the exterior. I've gone into attics and older construction standards had, were different. You know, they, they didn't necessarily uh, uh, require vents for your bathroom fans uh, to be exhausted out of the roof or out of the exterior. So I've seen dryer vents and, and, and a bathroom exhaust vents or kitchen vents just exhausting directly into the attic. Well, lo and behold, I've gone up in, and in attics, there's mold growth, heaviest, especially heaviest, right where the dryer, right where the vents are exhausting all that moist air um, right against the, uh, the roof sheathing or the roof boards, and you get a lot of mold growth, and lo and behold, uh, and long term, there's some structural damage. Make sure your gutters are routinely clean and your downspouts are extended away from the structure from your home. Uh, and that's a very, very common way that moisture gets into the structure if, if your gutters are not routinely clean and you got water uh, uh, jumping over or coming over your gutters and water is just penetrating into the foundation, your, the corners of your downspouts, making sure they're, that they're extended away from the structure. Uh, generally, about three feet or more, if you can, is good, but making sure that if you have gutter extenders, Get them onto your gutters. Um, if they're, I'm sorry, if they're not directly depositing into a drainage system, uh, just get them into uh, uh, extend those those downspouts away from the home to stop water to help stop water from soaking against the um, the foundation. Maintain proper grading, and that's another area again of ways to prevent water from coming into the structure. Uh, so your home really should be sloped approximately six inches downhill away from the foundation over the first 10 feet. If you're not sure, then talk to a landscape architect. Yes, uh, um, increasing your, your, um, your, um, your soil or your, um, uh, if you have landscaping around your home, uh, your mulch can help um, keeping, uh, keeping your, your plants, your root structure away from the foundation can also help um, but really keeping the grading, uh, make, uh, try to examine to see if you have any neutral or negative grading. So grading around the house helps move water away from the structure. Eliminate or reduce the use of scented fabric sprays, air freshener, plug-in stuff. Again, uh, those all are emitting volatile organic compounds. And people like, like sometimes like the odors, or like those sprays or those scented stuff. But a lot of them, are, a lot of them are synthetically made, and even some of the natural ones or some of the uh, that use essential oils can emit some, uh, do emit some volatile organic compounds, which 
some people are very chemically sensitive and can be can uh, that can be a, a function uh, uh, or negatively impact the indoor air quality, especially to some individuals. I know I'm very chemically sensitive. I can't even go to a flower store, um, especially floral scents, even if they're natural. I immediately my uh, my head just clogs up almost instantly. Um, if I go into a home that has scented candles or I'm sorry, those plug in devices, I almost can't go in. Um, I, my throat tenses up or, or tightens up. It's pretty bad. I actually went to visit my mother. I'm going to go off in a little, in a little uh, side story here. Um, went to visit my parents and you know, in their guest bedroom, I lay on their bed. And the second I lay on the bed, my throat swells up so bad that I, I couldn't sleep on the bed. She had used, got a coupon for some ball to drop into the, into the laundry to help make her laundry smell better. Well, that didn't help me very much. And uh, I could not sleep in that bed at all. Uh, it was pretty bad. And it was an immediate response. As soon as I laid on that bed, my throat swelled up and I, and I had trouble breathing. Uh, so, um, so those types of scented pro products are, uh, do emit VOCs and can elicit uh, those types of responses. Eliminate or reduce burning candles or incense. I know many people like to burn candles and you certainly can, if it's not affecting you, immediately affecting you or anyone in your household, you certainly can, but I would certainly reduce them. Cause again, not only are the odors, uh, if you if you like scented products, but also the particulates, the, the, the combustion byproducts, if you will, um, the, the smoke that can linger. Um, and um, so that's something just to consider. Uh, you also want to consider uh, buying either non-toxic home furnishings. There are plenty of, of, of resources out there that can offer furniture, mattresses, um, or, or other uh, home furnishings that are non-toxic. So it's something that you certainly should consider if you're in the market, or if you're considering purchasing new furniture. There are uh, lots of new choices out there and, and good, good choices out there. Um, do I have any that I specifically recommend. I, I really don't have any particular manufacturer, but there are a lot of good sources out there. Um, if you're painting or, or refurnishing or, 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 or refinishing your home, use either zero VOC or low VOC paints or stains. I can tell you that even if something is labeled low VOC or zero VOC, it's not, that's not always uh, uh, it, that doesn't mean that there is absolutely no volatile organic compounds. So it can be the base that may have zero VOC and they could actually say zero VOC, but if pigment is added to it or different paint is added to it to add color, those can have VOCs. So, so you could reduce it or, or reduce your risk as much as possible uh, by using zero or low VOC paints and stains. Uh, you can also want to select the highest rated air filters that you can for your residential HVAC unit. Residential HVAC units are not, are not fitted for HEPA filters, um, but you can use higher rated, uh, high rated HVAC, I'm sorry, air, fil air filters for your home. You really should consult with an HVAC professional uh, to evaluate your air handler the unit and they should be able to to tell you uh, what is the highest rating rated uh, filter that you could use the reason for that is is if you use a filter that that may be that uh, that may be too tight for uh, uh, too tight of a filter it could actually impact the functionality of your air handling system, uh, your fan, and it can actually uh, cause premature wear and tear and, and, and burn out the fan. If the fan is trying to draw air through and suck air through that filter and the filter is too tight. So, uh, but use the highest rated filter that you can for your, uh, for your HVAC unit. Most of them that you can find in Lowe's or Home Depot, the, the highest quality filters, are, are, are suitable for most, if not all, uh, residential uh, HVAC units. But I would certainly advise, you know, uh, speaking with, with an HVAC professional. Um, standalone air purifiers or HEPA filtered um, uh, standalone air purifiers certainly do help and can help uh, and do, re do reduce airborne particulates, viruses, bar um, uh, bacteria, things, airborne uh, particulates of that nature. For VOCs and or mycotoxins, um, 
I, if you want to use an air purifier or if you have an air purifier um, that has a HEPA filter, it should also have a carbon filter. Uh, so the carbon filters help attract those chemical compounds from volatile organic compounds and mycotoxins. Um, so, um, so those certainly do help reduce. You'll never have zero stuff in the air. There's always going to be something in the air and, and that's very typical and very normal and we should, uh, but you can certainly reduce the amount of particulates and, and contaminants in the air by using those types of devices. Um, going back to carbon monoxide, install low level carbon monoxide monitors. You can find them. Uh, most of them that are sold in, in the stores are, uh, have a, uh, have a range of about 30 parts per million. Try to find one that, that is sensitive enough to 15 parts per million. Um, they tend to be a little bit more, more accurate. And um, so um, I would certainly advise buying low level carbon monoxide monitors. Ensure that your sump pumps, if you have a sump pump, uh, make sure that they're operational and that covers and that uh, the covers are sealed. Um, so for two reasons not only for to evacuate water out of the structure, but also radon can does penetrate through, uh, through open sumps or open sump wells. So having covers that are sealed uh, is, is very important. And then also if water is sitting in your sump, but not enough to, to be pumped out <laughs> in your sump well, having cover, covers on, Oftentimes I see them in closets or, or in a small built-in cabinet area where sumps, are, are, sumps can be located. Well, that water can evaporate. And I have seen mold, mold growth start developing in enclosed closets or cabinets that are covering those sumps that don't necessarily have covers on them. So that water is just evaporating up and then causing, uh, causing mold growth onto those building materials. So... Uh, and uh, again, dealing with radon again, sealing cracks or openings in your foundation walls or your slabs. Again, you can you can do it using a, a silicone caulk or, or other sealants that are rated for either foundation uh, concrete or cinder block. Again, it's best to to uh, speak with a, ridicate, um, a radon mitigation specialist uh, to evaluate. But there are simple things that you could do to help reduce radon from entering into your structure. Last thing that I'm going to say is let the sun shine in. And also fresh air, again, fresh air is your friend. Open windows whenever possible, and that will certainly help reduce and, and improve the indoor air quality. Uh, here are some really good resources, and I'll keep this, this up on the screen uh, to find out more. And let me take this laser off. I forgot I had it on. Um, American Lung Association, healthhouse.org. That healthhouse.org certainly provides a lot of resources, especially for, for furniture, furnishings um, that, that you may want to look into. EPA has a lot of good information about indoor air quality, Consumer Protection Safety Commission, uh, Indoor Air Quality Association, which I am a member of. Um, there's a lot of really good resources on, on their website. <clears throat> ASHRAE, the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, Air Conditioning Engineers. These all have really good resources uh, for, for consumers and, 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 and residential uh, occupants and, and building occupants and building owners for tips and, and other resources for, for ways that you can improve your indoor air quality. Um, and again, you can always reach out to us and I don't know if... if you can see everything, um, but our phone number is on there. Our website is NovaEnvironmentalSolutions.com. We are on Facebook, uh, we, and we've been posting a lot of good information, a lot of tips and, and other information. We are on Instagram, and we just started a YouTube channel. Um, I am going to, um, at some point, upload this presentation to, uh, to our YouTube channel. Um, but we also are going to be adding, and we do have a few videos up now um, on our YouTube channel, but we're going to be uploading additional videos dealing with not only mold, but other indoor air quality, uh, more specific indoor air quality testing and things of that nature. But at this point, I'm gonna open it up to any questions that someone may have. And let's see if I could. 
I'll start with a question to get things rolling. Um, you had said during the last lecture that um, you will sometimes let your fan go in your basement to keep air circulating to prevent mold. I was wondering if um, you still recommend that. Yeah. So, um, key, if, if, especially if it's an unused uh, or an unfinished basement and you don't have uh, uh, air conditioning vents or, or air circulation going, running fans in a basement is a good way to, to keep air movement. So what, what air movement does is, is it helps prevent or it helps um, uh, allow for evaporation uh, of of moisture, so of dampness, humidity, but it also keeps air movement going. So keeping air movement is is really key. Keeping your vents open. So if you're in rooms a lot, and that brings me to another good point, is uh, in your house, I've been in many houses where they say, well, we don't use this room, so we're going to close the vents, or we don't use the basement anymore, and we're going to close all the vents. Well, that's not necessarily the best thing to do. Again, air stagnation can help promote or, or allow humidity to build up in those areas, especially this time of year. And that humidity, lack of air movement can allow for, for that moisture, that humidity to absorb into the building materials, whether it be drywall, uh, wood framing underneath stairs uh, to allow for molds to start growing on ceiling joists. If you have a crawl space, um, I know many homes in this area and many homes in the region were built with the crawl spaces that are vented uh, with the theory being, well, you're going to get you know, air, air movement and, and, and it's going to help dry things out. Well, new research and new, new standards are beginning to, to change or standards are beginning to change where uh, it's now best that crawl spaces should be sealed and have and be climate controlled um the with vented crawl spaces that's allowing the humid air to, to come in and if and if you have a, a soil a soil floor even if you have a um a vapor barrier installed on your crawl space uh crawl space issues uh are very very common and contaminants that build up in crawl spaces can permeate into the living space and, and can affect the indoor air quality. Um, so, and we get into, into crawl space issues at another time, but, um, but I hope that, but yes, yeah, so running fans, keeping air movement going um, is really a, a really good preventative measure, a way to help, uh, to help control uh, or to prevent moisture from building up on building materials. What if um, you have a crawl space and you have a moisture barrier, what would one do? You know, if you say they have a 120 year old house um, with a crawl space and a, moisture, a brand new moisture barrier, um, what else can you do to prevent mold? Yeah, so they, well, again, vapor barriers are, are uh, the evaluation of the vapor barrier. So really vapor barriers, vapor retarders are two different things, but vapor barriers should be staked down to the ground. They shouldn't be loosely laid, run up the foundation walls, run up the columns um, and be sealed. But if it's still a vented space, um, you may want to consider having it sealed. And I do have, have resources that, that do this type of work that do enclose that, that crawl space and, and install uh, uh, mechanic, um, uh, mechanical devices to climate, climate, climate control and dehumidify that space. Vapor barriers do help prevent uh, moisture uh, from permeating up from, from groundwater, uh, from the evaporation of water from the groundwater. But again, we're also talking about moisture that comes in from humidity uh, from the vents. Uh, some studies suggest that if, it's, if there's relative humidity between 60 and 70% outside, that humidity inside of a vented crawl space can reach between 90 and 100%. Um, so it's... Anyone else have questions? In, oh, let me stop. My... I have another one if no one else is going to ask. Chat. Oh, I see a chat. Uh, oh, okay. From, should sink and shower drains be cleaned somehow to avoid black mold collecting? So I'm going to address that. So not all molds that are black are the black mold. There are several molds that are black in color. So what we typically find around in shower drains or in sinks, 
um, in, in, in bathrooms. Yes, there can be, it can be black in color, uh, but most of the time, the vast majority of the time, it's a, it's a relatively a cosmetic mold called cladosporium, which does have a black in appearance. It really likes just soap scum and, and other, you know, just the natural organic manner that builds up around the drains and showers. Once it starts building up, it can be very difficult to, to completely remove constantly uh, without, you know, thorough cleaning every day. If it's on grout or on, um, on caulk lines, which is very common, routine cleaning can help can help it, but if it's just an annoyance and you want to get rid of it, you may need to replace the caulk or grout um, and uh, redo it that way. But it's really not generally considered a, a health concern because uh, it, it is not going to be quote unquote the black mold that everyone hears about. Um, that is black mold. The one that is most concerning is a mold type called stachybotrys. You're not going to find that on shower drains um, or sinks. Um, so it's it's difficult to have it and stop from uh, stop from collecting, um, if you will, around the sinks and, and the drains. Um, it's more just a cleaning maintenance. Yeah, it's ugly and and sometimes it can stink, um, but um, there's really no no special formula other than routine cleaning. Not one particular product that I would say cleaning uh, cleaning agent works better than the other. Um, a, a good scrubbing, cleaning, um, uh, just really is the only way to maintain that. I have a question for you. Yes. Um, about three years ago, well, about four years ago, we bought a house and shortly after we discovered, we have a full but built out basement mm -hmm. um, that's in the grade and our kitchen is downstairs. And the other side is two bedrooms and we were trying to do some remodeling. So we pulled down paneling and discovered a leaky window and mold on the foundation. Mm -hmm. So we had a company come in and do remediation. Everything was stripped down to the foundation and essentially even studs replaced almost in those two rooms. But the mm -hmm. kitchen wasn't pulled back off the foundation. Now they said that they only found mold on those and I know you guys didn't do it, but they, mm -hmm. they saw the mold and they cleaned it up along the foundation side and the side and they dug out on the outside of the house to do redo waterproofing and put in the new drainage system. Mm -hmm. Yep. So then they also, because I was concerned about the kitchen walls because we couldn't take it apart. Um, so they said they came in and sprayed some stuff like in the whole house. It's almost mm. like they fumigated the whole house. Yeah, fogging. But it was mm -hmm. for, right, something like that. But for to try and kill everything that might be growing, is yeah. that effective? No, <laughs> unfortunately, no. <laughs> it it really isn't. Um, and he here's a couple of things. So as far as killing mold and, and or removing mold, the objective, first of all, for any remediation work should never be to kill mold. Dead mold is still allergenic, toxigenic. It could still become airborne. Um, but um, so there are the, the professional standards call for the removal of mold, but spraying and, and fogging, what the theory is, and yes, it can denture some airborne spores when the fog, when the fog, uh, fog is in the air, settles it to the ground. Is it going to get and be effective at quote unquote, killing inside cavities and inside spaces. No, I, I have not seen it. I know most professionals in, in our industry have, have not seen really good research that, that shows that it's really effective to do anything. Um, even if they claim it kills 99.9% .9 of all molds and, and biological contaminants. Well, Again, killing isn't the objective, it's removing it. Yeah. And secondly, uh, you mean to tell me that you could leave a little bit is okay? Well, I, I just, it's just not real effective. So, but what I can say is from what you described, so the, when there is a leak, especially or a leak around windows, water, water does travel, but it's also, you know, gravity is a good thing. So, 
typically if if water was was originating around around a window frame or, or leaky window anything below that has is more likely to be uh to be affected and the lower the water traveled the more likely it is to be affected at the lowest point so typically if there's leaks around windows or or from or from flooding or, or things of that nature we tend to find the worst of the mold growth around the bottom foot to two feet of the affected wall and it gets less the, the higher up it goes um more just from capillary suction water will only suck up so uh, so far and then conversely, when water comes in, it's going to it's going to travel and get to the lowest point that it can. But okay. could the, could mean, there still be molds present uh, behind that uh, behind your kitchen wall? You know, it, it it's, it's anything is possible, and and especially if I don't know if there was any. If any sections were of uh, that kitchen wall were opened up to investigate, or any any specific sampling methods were used to investigate at that time, maybe or maybe not. But again, you typically try to go where the evidence is pointing to and where the tra where water travels to, um, and that's typically what's going to be the, the most affected areas. Right. Gotcha. It's just information I want to pass on to my husband. Because his response is, oh, but they sprayed. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, again, a lot of companies offer that. And so, and I advise and I do a lot of consulting and I do write up remediation protocols uh, for remediators to follow. It's a benefit to both the homeowners or the building owners and the remediators, they're getting an independence based on, a, based on an actual assessment, identifying the known areas. But Citing professional the, the the professional sources or the industry sources uh, of uh, standards that you know spraying fogging killing mold is is not remediation work. Um, so if someone was because there are companies that say we will come in and remediate by spraying and fogging, well they're not doing remediation work. So and I've unfortunately I've been involved with a lot of with several clients who hire these companies and spend thousands of dollars to they come in and spray their house with a false sense of security that, that they got rid of all the mold and when they really didn't, and they're still reacting and still having similar, similar symptoms once they're back in the house. And I pointed out, I said, well, look at all this mold that's still here. It's visible. We can actually see it and it extends into invisible areas by certain testing that we do and they're still responding. So, um, so if spray, but I have seen that spraying or fogging, many remediators will add that on after they remove, uh, after they do actual removal of, of mold as a, as another measure to help people feel better. But in my opinion, it, it just, it doesn't add that much value to the remediation process. Anyone else? I have one. What would you um, recommend for folks that are like wanting to one purchase a house and to have their house tested? You know, they don't have any great concerns, but they're interested in having somebody to look to see if there's mold or if there's things that are in place that could potentiate or or lead to mold. Right. Yeah. So I'll jump to that one first, or, or even as a pre-purchase. So. And this goes with any air quality uh, uh, testing or, or assessing. Testing alone does not tell the story. There are companies out there, there, and there are people that, yeah, we could do mold testing. Well, are you doing an assessment? Well, no, we're just doing the testing. Testing and sampling alone does not tell the story. It's a piece of the puzzle. So any assessment, whether it be for mold or other indoor air quality contaminants, should involve a good Getting as much background as getting as much history as possible uh, of the structure, um, you know, as far as you know, water intrusion, previous floods, leaks, things of that nature. A good thorough a visual inspection by someone who's trained and knows what they're looking for. Using devices like thermal imaging, which we use, uh, and other moisture meter devices to look for areas. Not only if there's any current moisture retention. But thermal imaging also could show where areas where there may be, you know, gaps around windows or doors or missing insulation, which can lead 
be to water and then they can penetrate in from from an exterior window or areas where there where materials can condensate um, measuring levels of temperature and relative humidity so those should all be functions of a good assessment in addition to sampling and the sampling should have should be a, a hypothesis driven uh, 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 sampling strategy. So why are we sampling? What are we sampling for? What are we comparing against? What information are we trying to gather to, to help us uh, um, come up with any conclusions or opinions about what we're, what we're investigating? So all sampling should have, should be a, a, a hypothesis driven uh, sample strategy. Again, so I know people who, and I, and many of you may have done it or have been advised to do it, do a hurts me or an ermy or do a Petri dish. Well, what is that telling us? Not much. It really is not telling us much. Um, and if you have done an ermy or it hurts me and have just done a Swiffer on several different surfaces throughout the home, you're not getting a lot of good information other than yeah, there, there's some molds in your dust. Well, I could say that in 100% of all structures, there's going to be some mold fragments, some molds that are going to be present in every piece of dust. That's just how, that's just nature. If you've done ERMI, and I'm going to get a little, a little tangent uh, about this, uh, ERMI itself, um, and if you're not familiar, uh, um, ERMI is a, a method that's supposed to be a, a uh, environmental moldiness, uh, um, uh, uh, whatever the acronym stands for, it's off the top of my head, it's getting late in the day, uh, 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 an index. It was developed by the US EPA for a specific study that they were doing. It was, and the EPA even said it was never intended for public consumption, but to get a, tr many people still want an ERMI score to see how moldy is my home? How moldy is my home? To get a true ERMI score, you have to use the, the correct ERMI sampling method. I have done ERMI sampling for clients that, that really want it, um, uh, but it has to be vacuuming from carpeting only in living room and in a bedroom. That is the only way to get a true ERMI score. It is comparing that sample or those samples to the index that was developed by, by sampling carpeting in a living room and in a bedroom. It can only be on a two square meter uh, section of the carpeting and for five minutes. That is the sampling method to get a true ERMI score. Um, I know there's a lot of companies out there that are offering that and uh, people say, yeah, get, get it, it hurts me or get an ERMI. Yes, again, it does show you what molds are present and can it give some historical information to an assessor? It may, but it really does nothing as far as evaluating the structure to determine if there's actually a growth source in the structure. Um, so my best advice is I, I personally, and, and I, I have not advised that for clients or potential clients, just because from my perspective, there's the data that we're receiving doesn't provide much information and it's really not, not giving anything as far as uh, in much more added value other than, uh, um, you know, that alone just doesn't tell any stories. So I went off my little tangent there, <laughs> but if you've done it and you, and I don't want to make anyone feel bad if they, if they've done it, you know, and, and you may get some satisfaction with it. Um, but again, it, it, and it's something where, um, I'm happy to, you know, speak with you one on one and feel free to call me or email me directly if you have a specific concern or question, even after this, I'm happy to go over no obligation, no, no, you know, no fees or anything like that, you know, that's, that's ultimately what I'm here for is to and what I strive to do is to at least provide potential clients or, or even just anyone information, you know, then that's, that's reasonable and, and to allow them to make decisions that's right for them. Any other questions? I know we're getting past people's dinner time. And if you all have, again, my, my phone number is up there, our, our office number is up there. Um, if you want my email address specifically, if you have a pen and paper, I could write that down. Um, it's 
Paul, my first name, P-A-U-L, at, and it's my company name shortened up. So it's Paul at Nova, N-O-V-A, E-N-V-S-O-L dot com. Awesome. Well, Paul, thank you uh, for taking the time to talk with us. Um, I know, I know that um, I appreciate it and I know that everybody else does too. So um, thank you again. And um, if anybody, if nobody else has any other questions, we'll, uh, we'll close the, the Zoom call. Sounds great. Thank you everyone for attending. I really appreciate it. Bye everybody.